Hey, everybody. Great to see you. Again, uh, welcome. If uh, this is just your first or second time here, my name is John Mark. I'm one of the leaders here, but I have been on vacation for three long, fantastic weeks. Um, it's great to be back. It was also great to not be here, but it's great. I'm not going to lie. No, it's great to be back. Um, I am a creature of habit, so every year we basically do the exact same thing. We go to the beach for two weeks, a friend's house, and then we go over camping in eastern Oregon uh, with my Bridgetown community, and I just love it. I feel like I'm in a fantastic place right now in my soul. And uh, what I want to do tonight is tie off our prayer series, but tonight is a little less of a sermon and more kind of, I don't know, if, if you and I were to sit down for um, coffee in the coming week on a beautiful Portland summer day, outdoor patio, whatever, and you were to ask me, hey, what are you learning, you know, fresh off a of vacation, a few weeks to kind of depressurize and take a long, hard look at your life? What are you learning right now in your apprenticeship to Jesus? I just kind of want to, this is like the lecture version of what I would say. Okay, so that's it. Really very simple tonight, straightforward, and uh, I don't think I'll take too long at all. To start, if you have a Bible, please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you don't, feel free to just sit there and feel guilt and shame. Um, it's a long-standing tradition in the Western church of guilt and shame, so it's an art form, really. So that's fine with me as well. Um, but if you prefer, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There's a line in the New Testament that I just can't get out of my head for a year or two now. And it's here in 1 Thessalonians, which is, if you've never read it before, it's a letter, actually, not a book, written really early in the first century, just a few years after Jesus of Nazareth, by this master-level apprentice of Jesus, um, who goes by the name Paul, to this church plant, brand new kind of community of followers of Jesus in the first century city of, we call it Thessalonica, it's actually Thessaloniki, in, if you wanted to sound really pretentious, nobody cares, but it's Thessaloniki, um, in Greece. And toward the tail end of the letter, he has this little one-line summary of what following Jesus is all about. Have a look, chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Say that out loud with me. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What does it all come down to at the end of the day? Well, moving through life from a posture of joyful, grateful prayer. The word prayer there in Paul's command to pray continually is prosukomai, which is the Greek verb to pray. But then it's followed by this little word, adeltos, which is an adverb that basically means without stopping. Here's a few other ways to translate the Greek into English. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It's a number of translations. Or here's another. Always be joyful, never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Or here's another. Celebrate always. Pray constantly and give thanks to God no matter what circumstances you find yourself in. This is God's will for all of you in Jesus the anointed. Or, as always, Eugene Peterson for the win. <laughs> when in doubt, quote the message. That's my philosophy. <laughs> Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. However you word it, the idea that Paul is getting at is crystal clear. We are to live from a place of joyful, grateful prayer. Now, what exactly is Paul saying here? Um, pray continually? Is he saying, you know, quit your job and throw your iPhone into the Willamette, and if you have a family, abandon it like the Buddha and wander off into the wilderness and join a monastery and pray 24 hours a day 
and then what, like for a week and then you die? Like what's his long-term plan here? Or is he saying something else? Well, I mean, of course, at one level, it's just hyperbole. He's just saying pray and pray a lot. But at another level, to Paul, and I would argue all the writers of the New Testament, prayer is more relational than it is functional. Put another way, it's more about moving through life in relationship to God than it is about doing something, or if you prefer, getting God through prayer to do something. Over the last two months, we covered all sorts of types of prayer. The Lord's Prayer, contemplative prayer, intercessory prayer, unanswered prayer, singing prayer, imaginative prayer, listening prayer, then last week with Alex, how to pray for people. Notice that intercessory prayer is one on a list of like seven or eight, and that's not an exhaustive list. But for a lot of people, when I say the word prayer, that's all that comes to mind for you. The picture in your mind's eye of you know, a missionary in a far off corner in the world, kind of old and haggard and tired looking, eyes closed, down on his or her knees, praying for a move of God. And that is prayer, and that is beautiful. But that's just one little corner of the room that is prayer or relationship to God. The most basic definition of prayer that I can think of is this, a whole life orientation toward God. That's prayer, a whole life orientation toward God. Robert Mulholland, in his book, Invitation to a Journey, which um, I'm guessing a lot of you don't recognize that book. It's a bit old now from the 90s, but it is one of the best books I've ever read on following Jesus and how we are transformed and I love his definition of prayer. Quote, an established posture of relationship with God that becomes the context within which we experience all the events and relationships of our lives. Let me read that again. This is prayer. An established posture of relationship with God that becomes the context within which we experience all the events and relationships of our lives. That is what we are after, a whole person orientation to God through all of the events and all of the relationships of our day-to-day life. I think that is what Paul is getting at here with this command to pray, quote, continually. His end goal for your prayer life, and by that I mean your relationship to God, is nothing short of a whole life orientation to God all day long. When you wake up in the morning and you have your coffee, you walk your dog, you brush your teeth, you exercise, you listen to NPR on your commute into work, you answer email, you design a thing, you go to class, whatever your life is, you make a coffee, you build a house, whatever your thing is, you raise a family, you go home, all of life in awareness of and connection to God. There's all sorts of labels for this kind of a life. Right here, Paul calls it prayer, quote, continually. But in his letter to the church in Galatia, he calls it walking in the Spirit. I love that word picture, walking side by side with the Spirit of God. Jesus calls it abiding. That's a first century agrarian word picture. And Jesus makes the claim that if you don't make abiding the center point of your life, you will bear little or no fruit. And interesting, in that teaching, it's in John 14, if you want to go read it, or 15, um, the number one fruit on Jesus' list is joy. Joy, a deep, pervasive sense of well-being at a soul level is more than anything the byproduct, in Jesus' mind, of abiding. Evangelicals in my church tradition that I grew up in talk a lot about a quiet time. Our Catholic brothers and sisters call it contemplation. Sky Jatani, um, in his beautiful little book, With, calls it life with God. Brother Lawrence, if you know him, he calls it the practice of the presence of God. I think that's one, that one is actually my favorite because this kind of a life, it takes practice. Have a look at this um, from the one and only Dallas Willard. This is my all-time favorite Dallas Willard quote. I've used it before. I literally have it on the inside of my closet wall at my house, and I read it most days before I go to work. I just want to read this really slow and give it time to sink in to your mind and imagination. He writes this. The first and most basic thing 
we can and must do is to keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part in thus practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds constantly to Him. In the early time of our practicing, we may well be challenged by our burdensome habits of dwelling on things less than God. Anybody? Or is that just me? Meaning your mind is all over the map. You're like, yes, anything but God. Next slide. But these are habits, not the law of gravity, and can be broken. A new, grace-filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps toward keeping God before us. More on that in a bit. Soon our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. If God is the great longing of our souls, He will become the pole star of our inward beings. How good is that? That is from The Great Omission, which Dallas Willard is a pain to read. That's the easiest thing he has out. And it's great because it's actually a collection of essays, and he has a little 40-page intro, and you can just read the 40 pages and kind of get the gist of it, and then you can pick or choose with the rest. That's from one of the essays. It's fantastic. I read it every year. You should, too. Moving on. Any other questions? Thank you. You know, we have this little turn of phrase at Bridgetown, the three goals of apprenticeship to Jesus. Goal one, be with Jesus. Goal two, become like Jesus. And goal three, do what he did. That is not a three-step formula, because following Jesus is not a three-step formula. But there is a flow to that. And if, in a hypothetical scenario, following Jesus was a three-step formula, or a formula of any kind, I have no doubt That step one would be, whatever you want to call it, be with Jesus, practice the presence of God, abide in the vine, pray continually, walk in the Spirit, life with God, get up in the morning and have a quiet time, whatever you want to call it, that is the beginning point, it's also the middle, and it's also the end. The longer I follow Jesus, several decades now, The older and hopefully wiser, but not necessarily, that I get, I just turned 37 on my vacation, the more I come to believe that life is very complex. Even following Jesus, I think, is very complex. But the most important thing in life is very simple. You wake up in the morning, you have Chemex coffee, Right, you all know this is an ancient spiritual discipline that is non-negotiable if you follow Jesus, okay? That was sarcasm, kind of. But you wake up in the morning, you get your whole person, mind and body, into the presence of God. And you do, whether that takes you two minutes or two hours, you do whatever is necessary. And then you move heaven and earth. You do everything in your power to live out of that place all day long. You might make it four hours, you might make it four minutes, but then you just come back, and you come back, and you come back. There's all sorts of other things to think about, and, but that, in my humble opinion, is the most important thing in life. And that place that Jesus called the secret place. Have you ever read that teaching of Jesus? Um, He has this great teaching about how, you know, when you pray, go into your room and close the door. Now, this is first century, okay? So don't imagine like a McMansion in Lake O, okay? Um, Like most of life was done outdoors, and, um, but most people had a home that was usually one room, and there's usually one door in it, and there was like just a little back room that was kind of a, a storage room slash um, mini barn for the animals, where you would put extra food and your donkey or whatever. It was really the only private space in a home in the ancient world, unless if you were rich or whatever. Jesus says, when you pray, that's where you go. 
like the one place where you can go and close the door and shut out the world and you go to that secret place. And for Jesus, it's more than a room in your house. It's a place in your heart, in your thinking and your feeling. And that secret place of awareness of and connection to the God that Jesus called Father, that, if you take Jesus seriously, that is the ultimate source of joy. For Jesus, there is a seamless connection between what he called abiding and what we call happiness, or he called joy. The, the line of, oh, there is no line, seamless connection between those two. That is the life that you crave. We live in a nation that we remember on the 4th of July is a social experiment built around the pursuit of life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness. We live in a city that has taken that to the next level and defined life, liberty, and happiness as a food cart and a bicycle and a fantastic beer on a Sunday afternoon. Ser- seriously, our whole city is like a temple to the god of hedonism, right? Like just how much can we eat and drink and how good can it be and fantastic can we just make loafing around? Like that's the city <laughs> that we live in. Seriously, I was gone for three weeks and I came back and I'm like, man, this city is just like utopia four months of the year. The other eight months of the year, it's, you know, Portland. But four months of the year, (laughs) utopia. We live in the city that is chasing after, whether you want to call it joy or the American vernacular happiness or whatever in our, a good time. And we're chasing after it in this next meal or the new restaurant opening or the new bar or new drink or a vacation or a hiking trip or a stamp on our passport or promotion at work or that business we started or more followers on whatever or however we define it. But the beauty of the way of Jesus is that joy, it's not out there, it's right here. And you don't need more money, you don't need a nicer apartment, you don't need a new car, you don't need a change in relationship status, you don't need a promotion at work, you don't need a certificate, like that's all great stuff, sure, fantastic. It's a whole other teaching. But you don't need any of that to tap into joy. There is an undercurrent running right beneath the distraction of your mind and the disordered love of my heart, of, in the language of the New Testament, love and joy and peace that is all the byproduct of life in the flow of the Spirit. All you have to do is slow down long enough to tap into it. It's waiting for you. So for those of you that are at that spot in your life where, where you want to tap into that, you want that kind of a life. Well, I think there are a few things that you and I have to do. So this is basically the three things that I'm working at right now in my apprenticeship to Jesus, um, not only over the last few weeks, but really over the last few years. Um, It's this, first, slow down. Most of us have to slow down. Most of us move way too fast through our day and our week, and next thing you know, our life, to spend any time abiding. A life of hurry will sweep the rug out from under a life of abiding. It's been said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Because, if you think about it, both sin and hurry have the exact same effect. They cut off your life from relationship with God. Think about it. When you sin, you have to seal off your mind from its default setting of connection to God, and you have to live as if God is not with you even though he is, to close your eyes and like pretend like he's not there. When you hurry, the exact same thing happens. When you hurry, you have to step outside of the moment in a futile and frantic attempt to bend space and time to your will because you have too much to do and not enough time to do it. And the moment that you step out of the moment, you step, you break off your awareness of and connection to God because God is always in the here and in the now. Not back there, not up there, right here, right now. So most of us have to slow down. Secondly, and let me just pause there. I don't just mean all of you type A workaholics need to slow down. You nod your head. The reality is a lot of you are way too busy and not because you're a workaholic or you're type A, because you have Netflix and you have internet connection and you have too many friendships, and like your, your life is just over busy, and, and it's, it's not even with, to be honest, it's not even with meaningful things. 
That's why I think busyness is an epidemic. It's not just like for type A workaholic kind of career people. It's for everybody around us. It's so easy to get sucked in to a life that is not life. We have to slow down. Secondly, we have to open up our life to the flow of the Spirit. That's what it's all about. And to do that, we have to remove any and all obstructions and obstacles to the flow of the Spirit in our life. One of my um, favorite teachers of the way of Jesus and writers is this pastor down in the Bay Area by the name of John Ortberg. You might not know that name. He's actually quite well known, but um, kind of he's a generation ahead of me, one of the best Bible teachers of my parents' generation. And uh, he was a mentee of Willard for like 20 years, and so I just, I'm like a super fan, and I read all of his stuff. And so I was just a few weeks ago, I was down in San Francisco teaching on a Sunday, and I had the chance to sneak out for the afternoon and go buy him lunch. And I just, I'm not a fanboy with a lot of people, I was so fanboy. It was like, I had my journal and my list of questions and I was like thinking the conversation through and like working on it on my drive down and my pen out and I wanted to record it on my phone. I just thought that's a little creepy. So let's <laughs> save that for the second lunch, you know? And, um, and it was just, ah, oh, uh, he's, you know, I think he's 60 years old and he's just every, he's everything I want to be when I grow up, you know? just at ease in his own soul. And sometimes you meet people and they're very different in real life than on stage. And he was just absolute congruence, the exact same person from the podcast and the book and all of that. Anyway, I was smitten. It was fantastic. <laughs> and it's just really great to be around somebody who's been following Jesus longer than I've been alive and has become a phenomenal human being through apprenticeship to Jesus. That just, like, is that not inspiring? So anyway, and to ask questions like, how do you pray? How do you follow Jesus? How do you pastor a church and stay human and all of that stuff? Anyway, long conversation, but one of my favorite things, he had this great little question that he said he asks before any activity. He'll just pause for a little moment and he'll ask this very simple question. Does this activity, this show on Netflix, this social media binge, this relationship, this whatever, does this open me up to the flow of the Spirit or block me off from the flow of the Spirit? And I, I loved how I framed it because I think when a lot of us kind of run an activity through the is this sin or not filter, we frame it through a moral lens rather than through a relational lens. And that's not all about, I'm all for morality, I think Jesus is too. But even more important than the question, is this sin or not? Really what we're asking there is like, how close can I get to the line without getting in trouble? What if that's the wrong question? What if a far better question is, does this lead me deeper into relationship with the Father or not? Because if the answer is no, then like I'm saying no, not only to God, I'm saying no to love and joy and peace and what I ache for at a soul level. Nicholas, um, Herman, uh, better known as Brother Lawrence, was this 17th century Parisian monk. Maybe you know his story, devoted his life to what he called the practice of the presence of God. He was a dishwasher in a monastery and nothing glamorous at all. Wasn't a priest or a teacher, but people would write letters to him from all over Europe and he became famous like just because he was all about practicing the presence of God and he was just full. Everybody who, who writes about him says he was just full of joy. And uh, after his death, his you know, letters were put together into this little book slash pamphlet called The Practice of the Presence of God, which, fun fact, is thought to be the most widely read book in the world after the Bible itself. And in this little book, this little collection of letters, he writes that the most important part of the practice of the presence of God is, quote, renouncing once and for all whatever does not lead to God. I love that framework. Just does this activity lead to God or not? And don't misread me here. I'm not saying that you need to, you know, like do church stuff 24 hours a day, all right? So like, come back, we talk a lot about work and about rest and about play, all of that is culture, all of that's beautiful. But run any activity through that lens. Does this lead me to God or not? And it doesn't have to be a church activity. It doesn't have to be, of course, reading your Bible, prayer, fasting, community, um, for me, like reading, I read a novel a week. Right now I'm reading All the Light You Cannot See, Pulitzer Prize winner from two years ago. There's nothing about Jesus in it, and I just feel like Jesus and I are reading this thing together, one page at a time. I just think he really likes it, and he's like, dang, that is some good writing. 
And I'm like, she's blind, but her dad makes her a model of the city. And it's like, just so, it's just so. It's just like me and Jesus are reading this book together right now. And it's like, I open my soul up to Jesus. It's just, so I don't know what it is for you. Maybe for you it's cooking or it's hiking or it's like ultimate Frisbee or I don't know what it is. You're like, I feel so alive. I'm like, okay, have fun with that. Whatever it is for you, does this activity... Does it lead me to God or not? Or is there a way to invite God into this activity or not? Because that's what it's all about. Open your life up to the flow of the Holy Spirit. So first we have to slow down. Second, most of us have to open our life up to the flow of the Holy Spirit. And third, arrange, we have to arrange our days around the practice of the presence of God. Like so many things, prayer comes down to your schedule. All of the P's on the Myers-Briggs right now are just saying, no, like you use the dirty word, schedule. I'm so, it's not authentic. Yeah, most of life should not be authentic. That's a whole other teaching. Um, But you know it's true. Stephen Covey of 90s daytimer fame, most of you are too young to get that joke, but um, had this great line about how we achieve inner peace when our schedule is aligned with our values. I love that. If you come to believe Jesus claims and Paul's and so many other followers of Jesus down through history, the deep soul level joy that you and I crave is found in prayer. And by prayer, once again, I mean relation, not just like interest, relationship, whole person orientation to God all day long. That, that's where the joy is found. It stands to reason that you would make prayer your highest value in life, which means you would put it at some place on your schedule. And of course, it's the both and, if you're a Myers-Briggs um, person, it's the both and of the J and the P, of structure and spontaneity. We need both, not one or the other. Based on your personality, you default to one, but we need both in order for a well-rounded spirituality and experience of God. All that to say, following Jesus has to make it onto your schedule or the odds are it will not happen, or it will be sporadic at best. Dallas Willard would frequently say this little line, quote, you must arrange your days so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. I love that. Think about your morning routine. Think about your kind of week. Think about your weekend, how you spend your free time. Think about your budget. Think about, you know, your relationship, your disciplines or lack of disciplines to your phone. Like, you must arrange your days so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday with life with God. He had this little follow-up line where he would say, you must arrange your days so that sin no longer looks attractive to you. There is a way to live in which sin no longer looks attractive to you. There are 86,400 seconds in every single day When you wake up in the morning, your goal and mine as an apprentice of Jesus is to live as many of those as we can in the presence of God. With our mind just to click over and set on God. The attention of our heart set on God. John Orberg again writes this, prayer more than any other single activity is what places us in the flow of the Spirit. When we pray, hearts get convicted, sin gets confessed, believers get united, intentions get encouraged, people receive guidance, the church is strengthened, stubbornness gets melted, wills get surrendered, evil gets defeated, grace gets released, illness gets healed, sorrows are comforted, faith is born, hope is grown, and love triumphs. In prayer, in the presence of God, we come closest to being fully ourselves. And I love his line here. The goal of prayer is to live all of my life and speak all of my words in the joyful awareness of the presence of God. Let me read that again. The goal of prayer is to live all of my life, and I would say the goal of following Jesus, to live all of my life and speak all of my words in the joyful awareness of the presence of God. So if that is the end goal, Right, that's the long-term kind of, you're on a journey of following Jesus, that's the destination. That's maybe a year away, 10 years away, 20, 30, 40, but that's the end-term goal, to live all of your life, speak all of your words, and the joyful awareness of the presence of God. How do we get from here to there? 
How do we get from right now I just like can't put down my phone and I'm over busy and I'm stressed out because of work and I'm behind on email and I have a dog and a roommate and, uh, to Brother Lawrence in the back of the kitchen just beaming like one dirty pan at a time. Like h- how do we cross that chasm? How do we, as Willard said, take intentional steps toward keeping God before our mind, end quote. Well, all sorts of ways. Here's one. Once again, this is for those of you that want to move forward. If you're not ready for that, that's just fine. There is a practice from the way of Jesus. Actually, it's far older than the way of Jesus. It goes back to several hundred years before Jesus himself. Um, That goes by a few names. I call it fixed hour prayer. Um, In the Catholic tradition, it's called the daily office. In the monastic community, you read about the liturgy of hours, which is this idea, but like on steroids. Most of the time, it's three prayer, three times a day, morning, noon, and night. Um, In the monastic community, it's seven times. It's like, here it is, matins, midnight, lauds, 3 a.m., prime, 6 a.m., terse, 9 a.m., sext, noon. Not sex, there's not a lot of that in a monastery, especially not at noon. Um, (laughs) None, 3 p.m., vespers, 6 p.m., Compline 9 p.m. So that's, ho- hopefully you already all practice this in your apprenticeship to Jesus. My favorite is Lod's every morning, 3 a.m. I'm just, you drive by my house, the light is on. I'm just there <laughs> in my office. You can't see me because I'm down on my knees, just face out before God, speaking in tongues, just caught up in the glory um, every single morning for an hour. So obviously that's like, crazy. Um, That's people who literally have a full-time job, and it's, what what do you do for a living? I pray, okay? Most of the time, you read about prayer three times a day. For example, um, Psalm 55, 17, evening, morning, and noon. Jewish day started at night. Evening, beginning of the day. Morning, the middle, and noon, the end. I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. I love how honest he is, brutally honest. Evening, morning, and noon, I read a liturgy from the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. No, I cry out in my distress, and God hears my voice. Meaning, three times a day, I pause, and I offer up to God whatever it is that I'm thinking and feeling in that moment, and I meet God in that place. One of the reasons that so many of you, if we're honest, in the room tonight, think that prayer is boring and have no desire to do what I'm teaching on tonight is because you don't actually pray, you pretend and you don't actually offer up to God what it is that you're thinking and feeling. You filter what it is that you're thinking and feeling because a ton of it is lousy, and you offer up to God whatever is left that you should be thinking and you should be feeling. Am I right? Which is just this like childish game that we play with God. Like you are aware he's God, right? And he knows what you're thinking better than you do, and he knows what you're feeling better than I do. You can't hide anything. In the language of Hebrews, the eyes of all are naked before God. I misquoted that. It's something like that. Something about being naked before God, (laughs) but not in a creepy way. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) Life comes in prayer when you stop praying what you should pray and you start praying where you're actually at. And you pause, there's a discipline to it, or if you prefer a practice to it, that's more of a yoga word, whatever, okay. Practice, you set a time, it's in your schedule, it's on your phone, whatever, it's in your routine. There's a dis- but you just stop and you offer up to God. Gratitude or distress, joy or doubt and anger and confusion, and God, I don't feel you at all right now. And you invite God into that thought into that moment, into that frustration. Have you read the book of Psalms recently? Yeah. It's, it's a collection of ancient Hebrew prayers. It's a lot of lousy prayers in there. Seriously, read it. Doubt, anger, lament, bitterness, rage, hatred, confusion, depression. Like the whole gamut of the human condition is in there as a prayer to God. You just offer up to God whatever it is that you're thinking and feeling in that moment. And that is a huge step forward. I just want to show you, I'm going a little long, I just want to show you one story before we wrap up. With your finger here, we'll come back and just read that last line one more time. But turn really fast to Daniel chapter six. Um, If you're new to the Bible, there's a table of contents on page one. This is an ancient memoir from hundreds of years before Jesus of Nazareth by a brilliant man, kind of a um, political genius by the name of Daniel. And uh, Daniel chapter six, if you grew up in church, you know this story. It's the story of Daniel in the like non-vegan lion's den. Have you read that story? 
So, um, fascinating story. The odds are you know it or you know the gist of it. I just want to read to you the first part of the story. I want to remind you what put Daniel in the lion's den in the first place. Chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius, king of the Persian Empire, most powerful and influential empire in human history at the time, it's before the Roman Empire, um, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, spread out all over the world, with three chief ministers over them, one of whom was Daniel, who's not a Persian, not a pagan at all. He's a Hebrew and a follower of Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Now, the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss, no corruption in the government. Now, Daniel, man, how cool would it be to have this said about you at your work? He so distinguished himself among the chief ministers and the satraps, his co-workers, by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom, make him the most powerful and influential man in the world after Darius himself. Now at this, the chief ministers and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, like office politics, nothing new, but they were unable to do so. Listen, They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Now, stay with me. So the chief ministers and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever, blah, blah, blah. Here's what we want you to do. Issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree, put it into writing so that it cannot be altered. So King Darius said, oh, that sounds like a great idea. I am awesome. Okay. <laughs> That's in the Hebrew, right? Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been pu- published, take a look here at 10, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for his help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree, and the story goes on, and he is in the lion's den. And if you wanna know what happens, read it or grow up in church, either way works. I just want to remind you, what is Daniel put in the lion's den for? Yeah, fixed hour of prayer, three times a day, morning, noon, night. Now, think about it. Is there, how many of you have read the first five books of the Bible or like skimmed? We'll count skimmed, okay, most of you. Is there a command in there, what is called the Torah, the law, to pray three times a day? A command where you have to do it. Nope. Think about it. Is there a command in all of the Bible to pray three times a day? Not really. Is there a command that you need to wake up in the morning and first thing read your Bible and pray? Oh, that's what most followers of Jesus who do well at it all do. But no, you don't have to. There's no command. Is God angry at Daniel if he like takes an afternoon off prayer? No. Is God angry at you if you, you're like, I've never had an afternoon on prayer. But is he, <laughs> is he angry at you if you like wake up and Check Instagram instead of reading your Bible. No, it's not a command. You don't have to do it. You're stupid not to, but that's a whole other teaching. Um, (laughs) But you don't have to do it. Yeah, think about it. Here's Daniel. His life hangs in the balance. Not only that, but he has the chance to become the most powerful and influential man in the world after the king and to shape or reshape the Persian Empire to more in line with God's vision for human flourishing. All he has to do is for 30 days, like just pray in the quiet of his heart. That's all he has to do. Just close the window for 30 days. That's all you have to do. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm like, you know, doing my hair or whatever, you know? <laughs> That's it. Or just say, hey, I'm going on a walk. Are you talking to the air? No, no, just on a walk. Just, that's all he, all he has to do. He is willing to die and to give up the chance of a lifetime just because he will not break his practice of fixed hour prayer. It was that important to him. Could it be that Daniel, who was just brilliant, that he was so smart, that he realized, if I don't 
practice this, if I don't ground myself in the practice of the presence of God, I don't stand a chance in the corrosive soil of a place like Persia before that Babylon. So far from Jerusalem, so far from the temple, so far from the Torah, I don't stand a chance. If that was true for Daniel, who is just a tad better than most of us in the room tonight, how much more so is that true for you and I? Not living in ancient Persia, but living in 2017 in Portland, Oregon, in corrosive soil, that of a secular, progressive, post-Christian city, how much more so is it true if you and I don't ground our life at a soul level in the practice of the presence of God, the odds are that you and I will not make it. How many of you have friends that were sitting next to you a year ago and aren't here anymore? I don't need fix-hour prayer, I'm not. Okay. Daniel does. He's kind of smart. I do. Jesus seemed to think he did. Not a, is this a legalistic guilt trip? Not at all. This is like how you get in on life. Like this is like how you get in on love and joy and peace. So coming out of our prayer series, I'm just about done. Um, I just want to, I don't know, is challenge an okay word? Call, invite, woo, whatever, suggest. Um, I, I, this is obviously your totally your decision, but I just want to challenge all of you to fix our prayer. And, and once again, I don't mean like 3 a.m., an hour, naked, whipping your back like in the rain. <laughs> don't Save that for the dark ages, all right? I, I just mean I want to challenge you to two or three times a day, pause, and set God before your mind. If you have an hour in the morning to, to read the Bible and pray and pull out prayer cards and do listening prayer, or great um, if you're not there right now and five minutes is a stretch for you, okay? Start where you're at. Start right where you're at. Um, uh, what I do is really, really simple. I wake up in the morning. Um, I make really good coffee that I can't quite afford. And um, <laughs> did you give me that pound of heart that was on my desk when I came back? Oh, I just love you so much. <laughs> don't even know. My wife got me that for my birthday when I was gone, and it was like the best. The Kenyan right now from heart is like off the chain, as they say. Um, I don't know who they is. That was like 1999. Like, like I think Tupac said that, but um, <laughs> thank you. I make my coffee. I digress. Um, and I, I just, I read, and I read a psalm. So in the morning, I read a psalm, and usually I'll do a little listening prayer. Uh, over vacation, I was so fun. I just would um, ask God a question every morning. I've been thinking about that line in Ephesians, find out what pleases the Lord. And so I would just, I had extra time. And so I would just ask God the question, um, what would please you today? And usually just one or two things would come to mind. Usually it had to do with somebody else in my family, my wife or my kids. And uh, hopefully I would go and do that a few hours later. And usually it was the best part of my day. So in the morning, I just, I read a psalm. I take a moment and I listen to God. At noon, um, I slip out of my office, usually for like a five or 10 minute walk. It's not like a 40, it's like five or 10 minutes. I pray the Lord's Prayer and I pull out my prayer cards, one, two, three of them. And at night, the examine. If you were here for that teaching, if not, it's on the podcast. Um, replay, rejoice, repent, and resolve. That's it. You can, you can take an hour each time. You can take five minutes each time. You can take five seconds each time just to start where you're at and move forward. Just to pause, to recenter your mind and your heart on God. And what happens is at first it's kind of hard. Um, but actually, after time, it's really easy. So psychologists talk a lot about the J curve. You know about that? Maybe you had that in a sociology class or a psychology class, a learning thing, where normally when you start to learn something new, whether it's like, the piano or Spanish or prayer, um, you, like, you start to learn something new and you think it's going to look like that top line in orange. In reality, it's going to look like that bottom line in blue. Wah, wah, wah. Like, normally, you get way worse at something before you get better. So, best analogy I can think of, because kind of everybody, if you're American, like, you kind of just speak a little bit of Spanish and play a little bit of guitar. Like, two things you, we all kind of do badly. You know what I'm saying? See, <laughs> si, right? Comprende? Um, 
You're like, see, that's the only thing I know. But we all kind of do both just a little bit and badly. So most guitarists um, are self-taught, right? So um, like back in the 90s, I grew up in the 90s where like we didn't have YouTube, and which is why, yeah, we just play power chords all the time. Um, so I thought that was funny. No? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Power chords are really easy to play. They take two fingers. Anybody can do it. It was a Dave Grohl thing. Anyway, um, when, you start to, when you teach yourself guitar, you naturally pick all down strum. Dun, 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 dun. And then once you actually start to pick it up and get better, maybe you take a lesson or you watch a YouTube video or you go to a concert and you pay close attention, you realize, oh, actually, the proper technique for guitar is down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And then you have to go back and reteach yourself the proper technique. And it's a pain in the butt because you get way worse before you get way better. And for like a month or two or three, depending on how much you practice, you just feel like, I got worse at guitar. I'm like, back when I started, I sound like an idiot. It feels unnatural. It feels awkward. Awkward and clumsy. It doesn't feel authentic to me. It's like I'm bad at it. Yes, you are bad at it. But you do it long enough, you don't give up. Some of you are like, that's when I stopped. Yeah, that's when you stopped. Um, <laughs> you, you don't give up. And, and next thing you know, it starts to become natural. And it's like becomes as natural as breathing. And actually, it's really easy. And you don't even think about it anymore. And then your guitar playing surges forward. Or just some, for some of us, uh, right? Goes forward. The same is true with pretty much any kind of practice. There's no different with prayer. Some of you were like, I thought I was pretty good at prayer. And then we did this like practice on prayer. And now I just feel like I'm terrible at it. Like imaginative prayer and listening prayer and saying, I can't even keep track of it all. Like I'm so bad, I just give up. That's the J curve. Like it gets worse before it gets better. Just stick with it. Even if it feels a little awkward and clumsy and forced and inauthentic and like a timer on your phone, just stick with it. And after a while, neuroplasticity will do its thing. And your mind... Every time you just get that little moment, that little free space in your thought life, a little break from the activity in front of you or whatever, the noise, the traffic, your mind will default instead of to its usual list of suspects, kind of worry about that thing tomorrow, and does she like me, and I'm really mad at him, what am I going to do about that, I really want to buy this, but I don't have the money, but I have a visa, but my mom will find out, like that whole thing. Whatever like the mental video is that plays in your mind's eye and imagination, that roller coaster that we all live on moment to moment, over time that will start to change. Not all at once, not in a moment, over time, through practice, through discipline, when you keep at it in the language of the New Testament, through faithfulness. That will start to change and your mind will start to default instead of to that mental video of worry and anxiety and lust and greed and insecurity, it will just start to default to, oh yeah, God's here. Wow, that's a beautiful day. Thank you. And it's not always like fun like that. Um, I'm driving home from the, from the Eastern Oregon, from camping on Thursday with my wife, family in the car. It's a beautiful day and we just get in this um, deep conversation where we don't agree with each other. We're in a really bad fight, all right? It's really bad, and I am so mad at my wife. And she is, I'm in theory, mad at me. And um, <laughs> I'm right, and she doesn't know it yet. Um, and we're in this fight, and it's just ugly and nasty, and there's a deep pain um, over this area in our marriage. And, um, and it's just a lousy way to end a vacation. I'm just thinking, really, the last day, like, seriously, come on. Um, I can't wait to go back and teach the way of Jesus. Um, just <laughs> that stuff, you know? And um, we come to this lull in the conversation, and I just have a little free space, and all of a sudden, God comes into my mind's eye. And I'm like, God, I, I don't, can't have you here right now. Um, <laughs> I need to win. <laughs> uh, you're, you're not interested in that. Um, I don't, later. I need you Sunday. I, I don't need you to teach. I don't need you now to win, okay? Um, but God comes, and in that little moment, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Because you all have these moments. Some of you a lot, some of you not so much, but you all have these moments. In that moment, I have this little sliver of an opportunity to say no, to block the flow of the Holy Spirit, or to say yes, and to open my life up to the ugly, selfish, narcissistic, angry 
part of my heart, this deep place of pain in a relationship with the person I love most, and to invite God into that mess. God help is about all I can get out most of the time. And there was this shift. And it wasn't like I turned and started to quote Longfellow and like, you know, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't that, but it, that, that turned it. And then we had, we had a great night together. All that to say, all through your day, not just in like an emotional experience at church, in the middle of a fight with your significant other, the stress of email tomorrow morning, a paper that's late, whatever your thing is, like right in that you will have tomorrow hundreds, at least dozens, little open doors, a little window where you can grab your phone, you can shut God out, you can stay in your anger, you can let your mind play that broken record, or you can just pause and say, come Holy Spirit, help, or help, that's, that's enough, help, or thank you, or I love you, or thank you for your love, or what a beautiful day, whatever it is, just, just right there. Those mo- the more you do that, the more you will do that. Amen. The more you teach and you train your mind to come back to God, come back to God, come back to God, the more God will become the center, not only of your mind, but out of that, your whole life. That's the invitation of Jesus. And guess what will happen? You will start to leak out love and joy and peace and patience. Will you mess up? Yes. Will you get out of the flow all the time? Will you feel like a tool shed if you're me? Yes. But then you just come back. There's mercy. Come back. Mercy. Come back. Mercy. And next thing you know, you're just there. That's it. That's the invitation of Jesus. And that is, I think, what he's calling me to. That's my life. What am, I, what am I working on right now? I'm trying to slow down, open my life to the flow of the Spirit, and practice the presence of God. That's it. I think that's what God is calling not only me, but a lot of you to tonight. And that's God's will for you. I love that line, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Normally when we think about the will of God and we ask that age old question, what is the will of God for my life? What we mean is what are like the major, what's God's will for the major decisions of my life? Do I marry him or her or no? Do I move to New York or no? Do I become a doctor or a lawyer or a this or that or like live at my mom's house and play Halo? Like what? <laughs> you don't need to ask that question by the way. But um, we think about major decisions and that's, those are great questions. But guess what? You already know 99% of God's will for your life. There it is, right in front of you in black and white. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Start there. The most important and most influential decisions you will ever make are not the major decisions, in my humble opinion. What city you live in, what career you pick, that matters. But even more so, you know what matters? The thousands, if not millions, of tiny, minuscule, ordinary, boring decisions you will make about what you do when you wake up in the morning. Your relationship to your phone. Do you have disciplines there or not? Are you in community or not? What about diet, exercise? How is your body and how do you relate to God? Like just that, what about free time? What's your budget like? What's your, like your relationship with your mom? Just these normal, ordinary, boring decisions that over time have a cumulative effect that make a life. How many of you want to come to your, the end of your journey, at least this side of resurrection, and stare death in the face and say that was a life well lived? Yeah. Willard's last words, eyes open, dying of cancer, on no pain medication, lucid, his last words before death were thank you. I would love to have my last words be thank you. If you want that, don't worry about the major decisions. We'll figure that out later. Start with what you know. Slow down. Open your life to the flow of the Spirit. Arrange your days around the practice of the presence of God. Move through life from a posture of joyful, grateful prayer. Let's stand and pray.